Thank you all for joining us, and thank you all of you others for, for coming, <laughs> even if you're not health professionals. Uh, I, Zeke, you know, we are coming up on just about the 10th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, right? I was in graduate school for health policy when it <laughs> passed, and I remember us thinking sort of, wow, I can't believe they did it. They did it, and we expected that to kind of be it. You know, we had done this really big thing, that we'd achieved this thing that had never been done before, and the naive grad student I was thought that we were done arguing. <laughs> It appears we are not done arguing. So I want to ask you, how do we get here? And what do we ha where do we have to go? Uh, well, how we got here uh, is, I mean, first, it's a very important lesson that nothing happens overnight. It does take years. Uh, I like to remind people that uh, the first bill to create Medicare was introduced in 1957. It passed in 1965 and was uh, implemented in 1966. Uh, so periods of time where you have to work up uh, define the problem, uh, def get a consensus around solution, and then move uh, into the uh, po political process and wait for that moment in the political process when things happen. The election of Lyndon Johnson for Medicare uh, in a landslide over Barry Goldwater, the election of Barack Obama, uh, where health care was one of his uh, top uh, three issues, saving the economy, health care. Um, so we have to prepare for the next moment. What's unusual about this situation is that we've now gone, as you say, nine years and a uh, little more than one month with no revision, uh, positive revision. We've identified lots of problems with the bill, lots of unintended consequences we'd like to reverse, lots of unintended consequences that were really not expected but good, um, and yet we have not been able to have a consensus to move forward. I do think the Republicans have uh, learned that uh, this is not a winner for them, uh, that they can keep banging away, but the, it only makes the population want to support more. If they keep doing this, and, and uh, it may be that President uh, Trump will run his uh, election campaign on uh, taking down the Affordable Care Act again, they're going to push more and more people to Medicare for all, because People want security on health care. They want to know there's something there. God forbid something happened. They lose their job in a recession or they get a serious illness. And if there's not going to be a secure platform there, Medicare looks like the best alternative. And I think that's what's driving the high poll numbers. The details people don't like, but if you push people hard, it's like, I want security, and that represents for Americans security. So you mentioned over the last nine years, there haven't been any positive revisions to the law. Were there mistakes that the Obama administration made in terms of packaging or promoting the ACA that led <laughs> us to that point? Don't get me started on that. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on history, but I do think, uh, and I've, you know, I've written this in my book and I've been pu pretty public about that, I think we were not very good about marshalling the physicians and the nurses, the people who the American public trust when it comes to health care, to articulate why we were doing this, what we were doing, and where we were going. And I think if we had created a good slide deck and put out hundreds of doctors in white coats with stethoscopes, nurses in white coats and stethoscopes, it would have made a huge difference, and we did not do that. And I think that was a, in my opinion, a, a major error. People did not understand what was in the bill. It became, it is a confusing topic, but you have to get people out there who they trust and who can explain at least the basics pretty simply. And Americans have come to realize, you know, there are a lot of good things here for me. I still hear a lot of complaints. My premiums went up. Your premiums were gonna go up even more. It's hard, you gotta to explain to people how to understand that. Um, we are, you know, some people are gonna lose their very good coverage because they were healthy and the insurance companies could target them by experience rating. If we go to modified community rating, your rates will go up, but other people who are sick or older, their rates will come down. We didn't do a good job of explaining that. I wanna talk about Medicare for All and this push-pull between that and repeal in just a bit, but you, you mentioned in your book some of the smaller provisions that perhaps can get some traction as we head towards that big debate, uh, things like higher cigarette taxes. What are some of the more provisional, smaller pieces of policy that you think might be able to get some bipartisan support as we head towards that cliff, I guess? Uh, 
Well, I do, uh, so here's, I think, things that we need to really push forward on. I do think cigarette tax is a very good example. We haven't had a raise, uh, I think, in a decade now, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Uh, we know that there's a very good relationship between raising cigarette taxes and uh, people stopping to smoke. If you don't start smoking by 21, you're almost never going to smoke. Uh, chances are very, very low. We could also tax e-cigarettes, which I think are pretty good idea to do. They're not uh, uh, so healthy. Um, I think uh, uh, there are other items, you know, we can think about uh, sugary drinks um, and see if we can get uh, some consensus about that. I'd say a second area that I think we really need to push forward on um, is auto enrollment. And it's very complicated in the United States. People have to go and elect things. If you look overseas, and I'm working on a book that's looking at other healthcare systems called the, uh, which country is the world's best healthcare system. And one of the things you see is auto enrollment, kind of like for Medicare Part A. You are alive, you paid taxes, you breathe, you get it, right? And I think we need the same thing. You breathe, you're in America as a resident, you get it. And we're gonna put you in Medicaid or figure out what we think that ought to be. I think that would be a very good uh, approach. Um, I also think people really want simplicity. It's become so complicated. Even really well-educated people, I need a navigator. You know, what am I entitled to, this and that. We need to take the myriad of plans we have and simplify them. We did this in Medicare, um, uh, Medigap. We simplified a lot of plans. I think Americans want simplicity. Doesn't mean getting rid of all variation. We are a big country. There's rural, there's urban, there's lots of different people. But simplifying. There's one of 10 flavors of plans you can get. Yes, you can have different networks, but it's got to begin to look much more consistent, and enrolling has to look much easier for people. I think that is something the American public wants. And last, of course, um, we all want costs to come down in the first place and most important place for Americans are drug prices. Uh, we have by far the highest drug prices. Just to give you numbers, we pay on average per person $1,440 or so for drugs across America. The next highest country, Switzerland, at $940 roughly. Um, that is just a huge delta, and uh, we need to bring that delta down. Again, we're the only country in the world, um, a developed country in the world, we don't have drug price regulation. We really do need, I, I noticed the sponsors now are gonna ask for me. <coughs> <laughs> um, but we, we do need to, uh, uh, I think that's an area, and that does seem to be an area of bipartisan consensus. Uh, I'm, I think it's a tragic mistake that President uh, Trump did not lead with that because he could have gotten something that would have been hugely important to Americans and a bipartisan win. Um, I do think we're going to have that soon after the next election. And before I get to my, ne my next question, we are going to do our question and answer through Slido, the, uh, the application you did your polls on. So start thinking about your questions now, and if you can input them into Slido uh, over the next couple minutes, we'll get to them. And please remember to uh, put your name and your title and your organization so I can say who you are when I uh, read your question. So I do want to put you on the spot about uh, something you just mentioned. You're, you're working on a book about the, the country with the best health care system. Which one is it? Uh, I we do not answer that question because I don't think it's a good question. Um, wow. And he, here's the reason. <laughs> you know, he, my students hate when I say that too, you know. Uh, he, here's the reason. If you look at healthcare systems, there are, uh, we identify at least 19 different dimensions that you would like to look at, right? You want to look at how they regulate drug prices. You want to look at how simple they are, how, much they how many people they cover, how innovative they are in terms of developing new approaches, how well do they address people who are uh, young, under 18, and make sure they get health care coverage, people who have serious illness, protect them from high cost. So there are lots of different dimensions. And one thing I will say, no country wins on all 19 dimensions. And that's why we say there's not a best in that. The United States does you know, come out tops in the most complicated system in the world. That is for sure. It is definitely the most complicated, mostly because we keep layering on things and we don't take previous stuff apart that's not working. We just 
add another layer to fill in a hole. But we are the most innovative, both in terms of thinking about new ways of paying doctors and hospitals to deliver better care, and um, new ways of innovating in terms of delivering that care uh, to people. So we have a lot of innovation going on in places that I never thought we'd have innovation. Caring for people with chronic illness, beginning to care for people with mental illness. It's a problem across all countries. We don't do mental illness very well. The United States has a lot of innovation in that spot. We're not the only country, but we're certainly a leader in that. We also have a lot of innovation in moving patients out of the hospital. If you look at Germany, for example, Germany has 40% more hospital beds per person than we do. Um, now, Germany is the place. If you want choice, it's Germany. Um, because you can see any doctor in the country, specialist, GP, um, uh, for 10 euro. There's no gatekeeper. That's it. And you know, free choice and also free choice of hospital. You can go any hospital uh, in the country. Um, of course, most people like to go to hospital within 20 kilometers of their house, but uh, that's another issue. So Germany's great on choice. We're, we're actually not so good on choice, despite the fact that we value it so much, but we are very good on innovation and complexity. That's an answer. <laughs> um, I do want to get to the audience questions in just a bit, but I want to go back to that tension about Medicare for all. Um, I want to ask you, is there a way that the United States can get to some semblance of universal coverage? And is that way Medicare for all? Uh, well, I, I, I personally think it's going to be very hard to get to Medicare for all if you define Medicare for all as the Bernie Sanders version of we're going to traditional Medicare um, where there's no private insurance. You don't end um, uh, private insurance in this country. You know, maybe we should not never have had it. Uh, that was a decision made well before I was born and anyone in this audience was born. Um, it's now a trillion dollar a year industry and I ne have never seen a country get rid of a trillion dollar a year industry, and they very effectively killed uh, uh, Clinton Care. I was around for Clinton Care, worked on the uh, secret task force, and uh, very much remember the Harry and Louise ads. If you haven't seen those ads, uh, go to YouTube and look at those ads, and they have very effectively, uh, as I like to say, made something people hated, their insurance company, into something warm and cuddly. An amazing, impossible transformation. Uh, but it did provide the nidus for opposition to Clinton care and really led uh, to its downfall. So is there a middle ground, I think, is the real question, in my opinion. And I do think that there's a middle ground. You see this proposal um, by uh, a Representative DeLauro and Ch uh, Jan Schakowsky uh, called Medicare for America, which is thinking about Medicare Part C so people can actually choose among private insurance plans also. That, I think, is a much, uh, uh, it's a more palatable option. It doesn't put private insurance out of business. There's still employer-based private insurance. I do think that's a, mu a middle ground. Uh, uh, another proposal is sort of Medicare Advantage for All, where one of the options would be people could select Medicare. Putting private insurance within a framework where they can compete, but compete under rules where people can choose regular Medicare or these Medicare Advantage plans, I think does provide a uh, common ground. It also would simplify the system. There'd be one exchange where people could go to, and you could restrict the, the variation uh, in the plans. I think that has much more plausibility. The other thing is Bernie Sanders' plan has a four-year implementation. That's uh, I think just way too fast, given what we've seen. You need eight years probably as a much more realistic time frame. But I do think you can begin to see some uh, consensus around a lot of these issues. Um, and uh, it would allow a certain kind of simplification while still giving Americans choice among the insurance uh, arrangements, which they seem to want according to the polling. Now, I hope everybody has been inputting those questions in Slido. We have a couple right here. We have one from Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. Uh, it says, <laughs> Dr. Emanuel, you wrote an essay a while back that you wished to die at age 73 to avoid senior years with low quality of life. Still feel that way? Uh, can I correct a lot of things in that question? <laughs> it was 75, first of all. Don't take two years away. It's already approaching rapidly. Um, 
<laughs> and it was published in the Atlantic. And one of the things that I hope most of you uh, uh, realize, uh, if you're avid readers of the Atlantic, is that you as the writer do not choose the title. That is chosen by the editor. Um, so. Uh, what I said in that article and what I meant in that article is that uh, I would stop taking life prolonging medical treatments where the purpose of the treatment was life prolonging. So if I got cancer, I would not be taking cancer uh, chemotherapies. But if I broke my hip and I was in pain, I would actually get that hip fixed. So that is, uh, I think, an important distinction which is often lost on people who actually don't read the article and just look at the title. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, yes, I have not backed down on that. Um, uh, position and sometime in the future maybe I'll write a book explaining it more. Next question is from Harlan Sonderling with Sonderling Brothers. If government pays more for health care, should government also pay more to educate medical providers? Uh, I think it's a great question and let me just say the following. We have created a kind of horror show uh, for medical education. Uh, the uh, average medical student debt is now about $190,000 and that creates perverse incentives. Even though doctors are uh, the single largest group uh, or profession uh, in the top 1%, uh, the way earnings go is right after medical school for a long time, you're a resident, you're earning a little money, and then you have to choose, you want to pay back those debts, and we end up perverting the choices so people go into high paying specialties like urology or orthopedics instead of primary care or go work in rural areas where compensation may not be as high. Um, and the, the total cost of medical education is peanuts when you consider $3.5 trillion healthcare economy. If we tax the entire system at like 0.2, 0.3%, we could pay for all of medical education. I've proposed, uh, and I think this is the right way to do it, medical school is free for every medical student. Uh, if you go into primary care or you go in an underserved area, whether, whether it's inner city Roxbury here or some rural area in upper Maine, that uh, payment for medical school is forgiven. Two years uh, service for every one year uh, you, uh, medical school was paid for. On the other hand, you choose a high reimbursement specialty like orthopedics, urology, neurosurgery. Uh, you have to pay back uh, that loan. I think that's a much fairer way of doing it and it actually advances uh, the social goals we have and I think you know might contribute in its small way to getting more primary care doctors uh, and more people in underserved areas. So I do think we could uh, substantially change without a lot of money. I mean that's the crazy thing. It's not a really big amount of money when you think the, about the payment for the whole health care system. And I was, it was something I was trying to push when we were trying to get the Affordable Care Act through but there were just so many other top priorities. Very briefly, one more. Uh, which Democratic candidate has the best, quote unquote, health care plan <laughs> running in 2020? Well, um, I haven't fully screened all of them, and a lot of them have just talking points, which is, I, uh, I think, uh, a problem. But as I say, I would look for a Democratic candidate who has a comprehensive plan but isn't killing all the private insurance companies because I don't think that's a viable plan and is going to roll in uh, drug price regulation. I think those are, you know, are we going to get to universal coverage and make it simpler? Are we going to have some real cost control? And are we going to have drug price regulation? Those would be my three metrics for evaluating Democratic uh, proposal. Well, thank you so much, Zeke. Thank you. And thank you all. Have for a your great questions. day.